Welcome, folks, to the squeaky wheel. And uh, it's a rather somber one, and I'd like to take a moment to say that we, our prayers are with the families in Ukraine and the unique challenges that happen through Europe when it comes to the divisions that have been, you know, set for many numbers of years. We are, we're, you know, proud for those um, nations that are stepping up to do their part. And the, the conversation still continues within the Métis community about, you know, how we, how we foster support, but we want to make, um, you know, a a strong announcement the fact that there should be no war we all need to continue to work together to try and find peace and again our thoughts and prayers are with all these with these families so lawrence as we jump into our conversation of this weeky wheel um you know there's been lots of um, agencies around the world that have also said the same thing you know where everybody's trying to do their part and sometimes there's a bit of um, what i think is challenges or miscommunication for example um everybody wants Apple to ban the app store in Russia, but then consequently what some things that are happening around the world are, let's not drink Russian vodka, let's not sell Russian vodka, let's not do anything that has Russian on it. But what a lot of people are unaware of is sometimes labels simply identify with the Russian community. Uh, For example, Stoli is simply refers to capital city. And from what I understand, This product, I think, is made in the U.S. So if people don't do a little bit of the research, all of a sudden they are just reacting, as often people do, and we start to ban everything. And I don't think we're serving the populations and and the economy and the families who work within those industries. I think it can be harmful. I mean, people have to do a little bit of the research. Yeah, I mean, if there's ever going to be like an economic sort of... uh... Uh, protest I think the business owners you know certainly have to think about that and you know think about other options to put on their shelves because you know we don't want to hurt the small business owners uh, by you know going after them you know because Mm -hmm. they already purchased the stuff you know they're putting it on sale and you know we're not buying it you know then that's something else entirely but I think the statement of sanction um, politically uh, that's where it happens too, you know, governments and what they, how they deal trade. Um, but I watch, you know, Russian ballet every once in a while. I don't think I'm going to really stop doing that. And uh, I know that the artists over there are certainly supportive of non-war and, and making those political statements. And that usually comes from the artists. So we need to encourage that. And, you know, people like Alexei Rebmansky at the Bolshoi Ballet who, who was putting a ballet in production to put on the stage finally said, well, I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to here to entertain the elites here in Russia. Um, and felt that that was a, a better place for him to make his protest. Right. So, Ooh, which is a very bold statement. Yeah. You know, in the world today, the, I think it's the champions league, the, the soccer football is supposed to be played in Sochi and they've said, no, it won't be played there. So I think there are, um, those political responsibilities and those actions that occur, like you said, with the sanctions, I 100% agree. But we need to be very conscientious that if all of a sudden, if you look that we, there's Russian hockey players or, um, you know, Russian sports figures, Russian uh, uh, artists, that these are, you you can't, we, we can't hold these people accountable just because they're Russian, right? It's not, this may not be their action. And we don't, we shouldn't be going to them to ask, well, what is your opinion? I like to think that most people are, you know, not for the war, but putting somebody in that position is very challenging. I think the dialogue needs to happen at a much higher political level to try and come up with, you know, what are the resources that this, um, this country is lacking? But again, I'm not a politician. I need to be also very careful of the fact that I'm not making any strong statements. Yeah, and quite honestly, I don't know if where Vladimir Putin, um, where his mindset is. Certainly, he's one of those old boys from the old days when Soviets kind of had their empire for a while there when he was communist. But, you know, they're saying he's not a communist. He just wants the same um, empire that they had in the past, right? So, but I mean, I don't know if it'll be abated until he's actually um, gone, either naturally or politically. It's just... The way it is that's happening over there 
Right. And I know his issues are with NATO and that he doesn't want to allow any of that um, essentially bouldering or bolstering control in communities around him. So the, you know, we're starting to see a lot of people speak out. Um, but folks, make sure that when you do do some of the research, if you're going to all of a sudden start creating sanctions within your own community, be aware who is that impacting and does it make any reference to the to these for example, Russian agencies at all. But I do think we all need to make a statement and, and do our part. And also, we, we have to be ready for the influx of, of new uh, refugees coming here uh, from the Ukraine. And certainly us as Canadians certainly open that door to them as much as possible. Yeah. The Mackenzie County, let's move on to a different topic. So here in northern Alberta, uh, folks, again, thanks for jumping on to the squeaky wheel with us, Lawrence. Looks like he's wearing his $5,000 power suit, as he always does, and his beard is a little bit uh, uncouth. But me, I'm sitting here in probably a $500 whole office space just put together uh, of knickknacks <laughs> as, I try to, as I try to engage in my conversation. But Lawrence, you look very sharp today. But up in, up in McKenzie County, northern Alberta, they're... I think it's a community of about 10,000 people and they're saying they won't work with communities that have vaccine mandates. So all of a sudden here they've put their foot down saying, if you are a company that is mandates for your employees, we won't work with you. Well, what do they do with agencies, you know, like um, emergency workers or, you know, provincial agencies? You know, I know that there's a lot of um, sell companies that had mandates for their employees. Shouldn't these people then be saying, listen, cut off our cell service, stop bringing the ambulances by. Um, maybe they should become a community where you can't live there unless you're not vaccinated. I'm trying to figure out exactly what it is that they are trying to um, put on the agenda. What exactly are they trying to say? Don't stifle us. Yeah, and I think when they made that decision, it was around, you know, when the trucker convoy was really headed to Ottawa. And ah. it was all about vaccines. And sometimes you get these, you know, county leaders out there that certainly bring in their own personal um, opinions about vaccinations. And at the end of the day, I mean, if I was a business owner and I heard that from a county, and I would probably go okay, but you don't control any of my business and what I do, right? And, and I, I look at the health of my, my workers as being the most vital thing. And uh, you'd rather just have infected workers go onto your job sites. Well, that's your, your opinion. No, actually, that's a really good point. You know, we hear there, they shouldn't be, and I don't think they are speaking on behalf of the, the um, business agencies that are up there. But Yes, there will be agencies that are impacted. <clears throat> and for example, you and I having this conversation brings awareness to it. Maybe us having this conversation is going to drive up the influx of travelers and visitors to the McKenzie um, County community. <laughs> I'm not too sure, but I like to think that, you know, we support uh, the travel industry through all of this province. Uh, I don't want to certainly don't want to step on their toes either. No, um, uh, you know, it's just a, a very interesting um, topic, you know, and discussion because, you know, we hope that it doesn't blend into other counties close to closer to us here at the region. And all of a sudden we're kind of picking and choosing. We have a campground and in, in a rural area and, and certainly we don't want any of that to kind of bleed into to that. Well, and, and jumping into some of the travel stuff, you're right. We have a beautiful campground. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things I was reading about was the white buffalo up in Métis Crossing. Now, Métis Crossing is sort of that first Métis-specific site, but it's just a little bit northeast of Edmonton, where people can travel to. That's a historic center, I guess, that's been developed. Right now, they're open Thursdays to Mondays. I was reading a little bit about it on their website, MétisCrossing.com. They have guest rooms, but the there's awareness, there's, there's um, art projects that you can work on, I guess, great education, but it'd be pretty exciting to see a, sort of the spirit buffalo i guess as it would be called yeah um you know when when they were encouraging the buffaloes to come um i know that uh they had looked at the the neighbor um who um, is a, a bison rancher and certainly some of those buffalo are coming from there and hopefully we get to those elk island buffalo 
um, which are the real true uh, genetic code for the real true buffalo in this in, in North America, and probably one of the only last major herds that's uh, really sitting there. But uh, yeah, um, if you, anyone gets a chance to go up to Métis Crossing, uh, the the historic site uh, is right next door at the Victoria Settlement, and certainly we um, we did have homesteads along that river area. And uh, we do have about, I think, there's 500 acres that are there, or 499 um, for the Métis Nation of Alberta. And, and uh, yeah, we use a portion of that for this cultural center. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was actually that uh, substantial. I think this would be, this is probably my best bison call. Mo, 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 mo. I, I don't know. Are there any awards given out right now for Buffalo calls? Well, no, I thought you sounded drunk there for a second. <laughs> I thought you were having a, a problem. <laughs> All of a sudden, uh, if you start seeing me bang, hit up my own chest, it's because I'm trying to get things back started again. Um, yeah, and if you if you want to think of the idea of travel, maybe you don't want to go to that uh, community in northern Saskatchewan. It's a First Nation that hasn't had cell service oh. um, since being promised by the provincial government in 2010. So a thousand people have been living there. And what a, you know, we've had this conversation many times when it comes to water, but we forget that landlines aren't as um, readily available as they used to be. And the ability to have cell technology in order for the safety, the security of moving around. What's the responsibilities? Do the, is the provincial government just waiting, going, hey, hopefully satellites take this over? I know we've talked about this before, but yeah. it kind of combines into a lot of the issues when it comes to the promises made by provincial governments. Well, yeah, I mean, Canada, provincial government, they make these promises really around election time and Trudeau being the offender for the water thing. Um, in fact, he can't even yeah. say water bottle very correctly, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> um, but but anyway, so yeah, so I mean, they do make these promises, and and certainly cell service is very vital for even to, even to get essential services now, like it's not uh, like the old days, and um, right, you know, people, if it, we didn't have cell service, could you imagine what it would be like? And me and you probably could if we think all the way back to when we were kids. There was nothing, right? We didn't have cells up until at least ninety four, right? So if I wanted to reach somebody, I just threw a rock at them. Yeah. I mean, Matt, we went through high school without cell phones. You know, we passed notes the old way. Right? That, that's true. Could you imagine? Now, you were chatting a little earlier that there was a fellow in Musquacis. Yeah, it was a young guy. Yeah, I've heard you, Musquacis, who, uh, who built his own cell tower just out of parts and whatever, because he certainly was getting <laughs> tired of the cell service there. So he decided to build yeah. his own. And I think that's what happens. People just get frustrated. They'll just do it themselves, right? Maybe that's the power of invention is the ingenuity. And you need one of these young guys who has that familiarity. Um, I know I have talked to um, somebody recently and he owns a company called Tangiers. And one of the things they do is they do installations. And it was actually kind of neat. I, I normally don't, you know, go looking for all this information, but I had a conversation with him and, um, just out of curiosity, we were chatting about what he does. And they do high installations, like fly helicopters in and they, they create mounts and they'll install whatever it is, oil or cell or these kind of towers or, or build it on mountain peaks and high levels. And I go, well, why, why isn't there a cell tower within a reasonable distance of everything? You know, we're trying to yeah. develop solar, but he said, not too sure that conversation is hard because the it doesn't seem as though the government is pushing that forward enough um i had to try to explain to him that i've never been on a helicopter before which i'm a little embarrassed by because i just think they're so fabulous i'd be so curious to see what it's like so i had to look it all up but i, I came to to see the kind of work that they did and this is one of those things where communities should be um allowed to figure out a way to get themselves on the grid. And if they've got to be the one just to ask, folks, uh, reach out to us. We'd love to steer you and be a part of that conversation of mm -hmm. how do we connect you with an agency that can help you when it comes to that, you know, the questions of water. Who, who, or where do we find the agencies that can support to ensure that the, 
what almost becomes the necessity of being water, but now other vital services such as the protection provided by say cell service. Um, yeah, those are, those are questions we want to continue to help answer within these communities. And stay away from the 5G talk, you know. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Because you That's might right, have protesters they're watching you everywhere. Yeah. No, we don't <laughs> want cell right. towers. Right. Start chaining ourselves to, uh, to something. Lawrence, let's talk a little bit about regional stuff. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening right down here within Region 3. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're hosting the assembly this year. So um, Audrey Putra, our provincial president, and I had sat down a few days ago and discussed where things will be happening. So uh, we're more than likely going to go with Gray Eagle Casino. I know by the time this reaches um, everybody... Uh, we'll be sitting over there meeting on on Wednesday anyway. So, uh, yeah, oh, we're good. pretty excited about bringing that here in August, and and look forward to a lot of uh, people coming. And but I, I estimate we'll probably get a couple thousand at least of our members walking through the doors from Thursday to Sunday. And um, yeah, so I think we'll get a lot of traffic, and especially having Constitution talks and all those things. So it should be pretty exciting. Oh, heated and exciting. You know, yeah. again, we all, everybody wants to have an opinion, but I think those individuals who are coming to the assembly are doing their part. So I'm excited to um, hear more about it and how the development, and I mean, at this time, as we as we struggle to get through the challenges of, of understanding every mandate that's out there and how some of them are going to end, it's nice to have that as something to look forward to. Um, pretty sure we're going to be at that space where, we're going to feel much more comfortable having people within our communities and that this this gathering is going to be successful. So I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, newsletter, Lawrence. Yes. So our I think our fifth newsletter now, it's been a hit. Uh, we actually hired um, a young Métis girl. She's producing it. I think she's doing quite a, a, a wonderful job at it. And... Uh, I know Ross is featured in this one as a community member, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. I think more, it was just sort of, hey, we got to get this out. And uh, they pretty much just looked around the room and said, Ross, are you free for the next 10 minutes? Yeah. Well, but- actually, that's probably not far from the truth because we did have a last minute cancellation. <laughs> and we thought, well, Ross already has his profile already written. So we just give him a call. Right? Well, hold on here, folks. I don't want you to think that I'm just <laughs> sitting around with like 10 or 15 different profiles in my pocket. But yes, due to the nature of my band and my satellite business, you're right. I occasionally have a little bit of information that I may need to pass along. But yeah, hopefully this the the pictures that they have of me aren't when I'm coming out of the Cecil Hotel 20 years ago or something like that, hopefully they're, they're uh, engaging photos is what I'd like to. Yeah, and if you ever have. sit in a meeting with Ross and he introduces himself and there's a big, large room, you probably have to give him maybe 10 or 15 minutes just and tells us what he does and <laughs> who he knows and where he's been. And, I yeah. always say, don't ask who the politician in the room is. Just wait. <laughs> They'll tell you. <laughs> Oh, Lawrence, so great. Um, successful Métis Mixer that we had, and I know we talked about it last week, but let's. sounds like there's going to be a change down at the Law Heat House. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, the what, the executive director, uh, Kristen Evenden, who comes to all of our Métis events too, and she's, she's yeah. not Métis, but she's a wonderful advocate for Métis people. And she's the only one I know that can nail down the land acknowledgement by memory of all the nations, everybody. <laughs> Just perfectly. Uh, unfortunately, she's leaving and going to a national organization based out of Ottawa for museums. And we're going to miss her quite a bit. And But, you know, she said she'll be around. She's going to be Calgary based. So she'll come to our events every now and then. It just gave me a fabulous tour of the Lougheed House. Um, it felt like it was, you know, there was just a few of us. It felt like a nice private tour of, of getting a lot of the awareness. And, you know, you could ask any questions. It, she is such a great advocate for ensuring that history is recorded, uh, history is represented properly. So Kristen, I will be firing off a message to you shortly. Uh, best wishes to you and I'm, I look forward to our next conversation and, and I'm excited for you and where you're gonna take um, the awareness of history to such, such a much larger scale. But she's been in, in many areas of, um, of our city and province when it comes to uh, the 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 different levels of awareness. So very exciting for her.
This episode brought to you by Métis Nation of Alberta, with a vision of a strong Métis Nation embracing Métis rights, and a mission to pursue the advancement of the socioeconomic and cultural well-being of the Métis people of Alberta. For more information, go to www.albertamétis.com. Now, back to the show. Here's something fun I wanted to throw at Lawrence, because as we chat a little bit about uh, sports, uh, as we often do, I know you want to make a comment about the Habs. Don't, we're going to get there. <laughs> Nobody's interested in Montreal but anyways, but the, and I think most of us are all Oilers and Flames fans, but before we get there, Major League Baseball, I don't even want to have the conversation about the, that they're still within their strike talks. It's challenging. It's unique. And I'm sure that's their own world that it's, it's all business. But the one thing I did want to bring out as a professional major league um, baseball comment was, and and I think this is probably something that you may not have a lot of familiarity with, but back in the 40s, Yolanda Tillet, and she was nicknamed Yo-Yo. And this was really fun that I was reading about it. She was one of, she was the first Métis Canadian baseball catcher. And she's in the Canadian Hall of Fame, born in St. Vital, Winnipeg. She was one of the first Métis players to ever play professional baseball in the United States. Since the 40s, she was known as a standout catcher um, for the famed St. Vital Tigrettes. Soon after, she was scouted to play in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, which you remember the, um, the one with Tom Hanks, the TV show? During her time in the league, she played for the... Now, folks, I didn't name these ones, so please, when you send your, your scathing anger emails... The Lawrence and I did not name these teams, but Fort Wayne Daisies back in 1945. She played for the Grand Rapids Chicks in 1946 and the Kenosha Comets in 1947. And then she was inducted to the Hall of Fame in 1988. So it was just wonderful reading about her. It's a beautiful picture. uh, Leighton, maybe we can fire a picture up, but you can read more about her if you look up uh, Métis Canadian baseball players. She Mm. pops up quite quickly. Well, I mean, she she probably did. She she was a catcher. She probably didn't cry in baseball. I mean, that's a term <laughs> from the movie. That that's right. There's um, no crying in baseball. Yeah, uh, but no, I mean, that's a, a very tough role. I mean, I was a catcher, um, and that's how it kind of relates to me, I guess, when growing up and went through little league and a bit of Babe Ruth and and uh, before I left for my dancing stuff. But I always find that you know being in a crouch really helped me when I got to ballet class for some reason. Um, Really? Building those legs and those knees and those things. But uh, no, I, I, I loved playing ball. I, that's what you did in Prince George predominantly was hockey and baseball, right? So, but if you, if you just have people throwing stuff at you constantly, yeah. are you, are you really a catcher, Lawrence? Like, I'm sure they were throwing rocks. Oh, no. Uh, beer it got cans. to the point where I think <laughs> Lee J. Leslie was, was going to the WHL and he was pitching with me. And I was starting to catch fastballs from a junior hockey player, and he was over six feet tall. And I thought, oh, my God, I have i don't know if I want to be a catcher anymore, right, <laughs> after a few of those games. Yeah, and when that ball sinks down and hits the ground and you've got to yeah. just get, get your body in front of it, Lawrence, got to get your butt, knock that ball down. Oh, there's no doubt. Those things sting. But like you said, there's no crying in baseball. You just get up, try and walk it off, and uh, – pray that his next pitch just comes down the right down the pipe and it doesn't hit you anywhere uh you want to talk a little bit about nhl hockey well yeah i mean well the habs are on a roll they won five games in a row i think that's fantastic even though they're bottom of the league um i think they went to uh they passed arizona coyote so you know they're second from the bottom now so they're creeping up maybe they'll have a chance to make the playoffs i don't know well, and one of those things, and it, my wife had said it a long time ago, and I was embarrassed that I hadn't said it before in all the years that I'd known her. She says, um, I think Montreal beat Tampa Bay the other day. Yeah. And as she has pointed out in the past, it's not who you're playing. It's who you're playing that day. Oh, it was such a good quote. And yeah, you're right. The Flames won 10 in a row. The Oilers yeah. were on a fabulous winning streak. But I think Calgary went into Vancouver thinking, we got to keep preparing for the next teams. Well, Vancouver turned around, had a fairly solid game, ended up breaking that wonderful streak where most of us were like, well, this should probably be a win for us. We're on the right track, but it's who you play that day. And it is exciting, right? I mean, as, as some of the other sports are not going to be maybe not happening anytime soon, um, I'm, I'm having a great time 
with watching the NHL and the Canadian teams that are happening right now. And I'm all for the Habs. If they could do well and win, right, our Canadian communities need that strength. Well, I think, um, you know, I don't want to upset any Calgary Flame fans, but I really feel that, you know, if they're losing, maybe they have better chances of getting into a new arena. Um, <laughs> Because oh, well, people could say the Saddle Dome's cursed and we need to build a new arena. Let's get going here, right? And let's help our hockey team. But I, I really firmly believe we need a new arena. That's that's without a doubt, uh, the way I think anyways. I mean, I, Well, and as a community, yeah. you know, we need a better center for where we can have these large gatherings for um, events. And then, yeah, an arena does bring people into the community. But who's going to pay for it? That's the other thing, right? That's the big question. But no, I think I look at the Saddle Dome, even the way it's shaped, I go, yeah, this is from the 80s. I don't know. I can't relate to this. <laughs> Though I love the shape of that. I think it's fabulous. Oh, the light's on, Lawrence, and it's time for just uh, one of our scam comments. Late and fire off the sounds. Let's get this rolling. The the one thing I just wanted to talk about today is, folks, our, right at the start of the show, we talked about the how to support Ukraine, how to be uh, anti-war. If somebody's reaching out to you, and you will start to see that there's a lot of conversation happening at the level of the Red Cross. All I want you to do is, as I've said it many, many times before, if somebody reaches out to you, it becomes awareness. Now your actions with that can put you at risk. And what I'm trying to make a point of is, if you want to support or follow through with supporting the Red Cross, at this time, the Canadian government is saying, we will match your funds. Go to the internet yourself, whichever browser, and type in www.redcross.ca. And as you navigate through there, you will find the areas where you can donate to, to, to the agency, however you would like to donate to them. And folks, I'm not singling this one out. Any agency you want to go to, I highly recommend you type in, go to their website. What happens in the scam world is you will get an email saying, all the information you want to read, you are, if you want to support the Red Cross and the Canadian government's going to support you and you click a link, if you're not paying attention, it will take you to a page that looks exactly like the real Red Cross page, for example. And from there, you are typing your information into the wrong page because you have potentially followed uh, a threat actor's link. So what I'm trying to suggest is it may create some awareness, but be very conscientious. If you do the work of going to the website, you're much less likely to be at risk than if you click a link to try and figure out how to support. And we all want to do our part, but it's even harder on you when you start to feel like a victim because you've fallen into somebody else's scam when by clicking a link. Lawrence, comment. No, that's a great, uh, uh, great uh, thing to point out. There's going to be a lot of agencies out there that are already doing this work, and you know, people that we know are comfortable with, like you know, Salvation Army or Red Cross, and those places. You know, you'll you'll get services there. Um, and certainly, looking at the local immigrant societies when the, those refugees come, you know, that's uh, another aspect to support. And really, yeah, be careful on those emails that are coming in and be careful of those phone calls and be careful of, of those, those websites with those forms that don't look quite right or have spelling mistakes or, you know, are blurry looking or whatever. So. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's a really good point, Lawrence. Um, often we look at it and we go, well, that's odd. They made a spelling mistake. That is your first clue mm -hmm. that this is not a legitimate site, right? These things rarely happen, but yeah, be very conscientious of that. Lawrence, uh, we're running short on time, but folks, when you get those opportunities, make sure you email Lawrence or Ross at thesqueakywheel.ca, uh, or you can reach out to our team, TSW at thesqueakywheel.ca from late and behind the scenes. He does such a great job. How I wanted to make our comment, Lawrence, but that was very generous of you um, to, to bring to attention. Folks, watch for the, the next Region 3 newsletter. But Lawrence, I don't even know if you know this, but I was perusing the Aboriginal Friendship Center website the other day and if you type in aboriginal friendship center uh calgary folks it'll take you likely to their website and they have a newsletter which happens to be called when friendship comes full circle and lawrence it's a beautiful article about you 
Um, you, they can see that wonderful picture that's behind you there of you in the ballet with your dance partner and a very nice write-up. I don't even know if you knew that that was in there. But yes, folks, I'll have Leighton throw it up here on the screen. And then I encourage you, go to that website, look for ways to support, stay connected within your community. Lawrence, this is the squeaky wheel. Close us out. Yes, uh, thank you, Ross, uh, for that. Uh, as was definitely a surprise. Um, I'll definitely go check out and see if there's any spelling mistakes and stuff like that, see if it's a legit <laughs> um, article. Um, but no, uh, thanks to the Friendship Centre for profiling me and, and look forward to uh, many more, hopefully one day. Um, and, you know, if anybody has any questions or coffee or they want to start doing that, I'm starting to get a little more comfortable coming out of my shell a little bit more. Uh, we look forward to this uh, new balance that we'll have uh, the March 1st, see how that affects us with the opening the door. Um, I'm not ready to open that door wide open just yet, but uh, definitely look forward to the future and, and a good summer. Hopefully we all get there. Yeah, let's, ho let's hope for that good summer. So folks, from all of us here at the Squeaky Wheel, thanks for listening. Thanks for connecting with us. Thanks for clicking to subscribe. Make sure you follow us anywhere that you can. It means a lot to us and it means a lot to our sponsors. So the best wishes, from all of us here, keep the wheel squeaky. The Squeaky Wheel is brought to you by the Squeaky Wheel Company, co-hosted by the President, Lawrence Gervais, MMA Region 3, and the Captain, Ross Memphis Pamper. Our program is broadcast from Calgary, in Region 3 of the Métis Nation of Alberta, which is part of the historic Métis Nation homeland. We also acknowledge these lands are the traditional territories of Treaty 7, like the Confederacy, Sitka, Gainai, Gandhi, Lutsina, and Stony Nakoda whom we share this land on the basis of our historical and ongoing relationships. You can always reach us for comment about our programming by email at tsw at thesqueakywheel.ca or find us on our website, www.squeakywheel.ca and our socials. For our comments, it is our focus to recognize all of our First Nations and Indigenous friends, share a connection with Métis settlements, and listen to and show respect to our Métis brothers and sisters and families. Here at the Squeaky Wheel, we give thanks to our elders for their guidance and to Mother Earth for her time. She allows us to be here and share her bounty. From all of us at the Squeaky Wheel, Danze.